Welcome to the lecture series on vitamins and nutrition. Today we are going to look at one of the most important water soluble vitamins thiamine. We have been looking at thiamine for quite some time and in today's session we are going to look at different aspects of thiamine especially the metabolic role of thiamine and how thiamine is extremely essential in carrying out many metabolic conditions and above all we are going to look at some of the deficiency diseases that results. So, especially as you see over there, so this is the question a list I have been repeating and it speaks about different kinds of beriberi, different complications connected with beriberi and so on. So, today uh, we are going to like brush up little bit about uh, the metabolic function of thiamine what we started in the previous session. So, we know that vitamin thiamine is such an important vitamin in, in a way because vitamin thiamine cannot be synthesized by our human body. We are always dependent on dietary sources. Although some amount of thiamine can be contributed from the bacteria which grows in the gastrointestinal tract as part of a commensal systems where we have a very good I would say uh, relationship with this good colony of bacteria and they provide many water soluble vitamins and uh, they have very good beneficial effect. But some of the vitamins what they produce may not be sufficient enough. So, we always have to supplement with dietary sources. Now, coming back to thiamine. So, I have been telling you about thiamine the activation aspect of thiamine. Now, we are going to look at how thiamine plays an important role. So, today I am going to take you through some of the metabolic role that thiamine is playing. See look here, so thiamine is basically a very essential compound and thiamine once gets activated into TPP. So, that is basically thiamine pyrophosphate. So, uh, another word a very common terminology for TPP is also thiamine diphosphate. So, if you look into the structure you would be very much interested in looking at how thiamine plays an important role. So, you see this cycle where glucose gets converted to glucose 6-phosphate. Now, glucose 6-phosphate in the glycolytic pathway actually ends up being a pyruvate. Now, this pyruvate is one of the key components and pyruvate needs to be converted into acyl-CoA. The moment it gets converted into acyl-CoA, it becomes eligible to enter the citric acid cycle. So, you see this is one pathway which is very important for us to provide energy and in addition to that we have one more pathway the ribose I would say 5-phosphate pathway. So, this is one more pathway and finally, what we have is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate which also sometime or the other enters into this pathway what we consider it to be a secondary pathway, but these two pathways are essential. So, you see here uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, transketolase and alpha ketoglutarate. In other words alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. So, we have two dehydrogenases one is pyruvate dehydrogenase the other one is alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase and then one more enzyme in the ribose 5 phosphate pathway which is basically the transketolase. All of these three enzymes use thiamine pyrophosphate as a coenzyme. So, that is why we see in one of the major pathways some of the major pathways the citric acid cycle pathway as well as the ribose 5 p pathway where we are dependent on producing energy every cell in our body every metabolically active cell in our body is involved in this particular pathway to generate energy. So, you see some of the key enzymes in that pathway are dependent on TPP. So, that is why lack of TPP it means lack of thiamine would be one of the major deficiency conditions and that can literally drain us from all the energy what we require. Now, going back as I told you earlier. So, this is what I call as oxidative decarboxylation. So, that is very interesting to look at. So, maybe I can take you through some of uh, the structures then you would appreciate it better. So, look here this is a little recap of what we have been doing on the 
medicinal chemistry aspect of vitamin B1. So, you see vitamin B1 as two structures substituted pyrimidin and substituted thiazole and they are linked by a methylene bridge. So, since it contains the thiazole ring so that is why it is called thialamine or thiamine. So, you see there this particular enzyme which basically is important I would say in carrying out the metabolic process and most of them they depend on cofactors. So, cofactors are basically compounds which have a very important role in support of the main enzyme. So, you see there could they could be a metallo organic molecule they could be complex group and if it is going to be a complex group we use this word coenzyme ok. Now, as you look at this particular equation look here here you have the pyruvate. So, pyruvate is a keto carboxylic acid and then this pyruvate gets decarboxylated to form acetaldehyde and then this acetaldehyde is further I would say converted into in other words reduced into I would say ethanol. So, look here here you have a carboxyl group and this carboxyl group is basically removed by pyruvate decarboxylase and this reaction in this reaction the pyruvate decarboxylase uses TPP and magnesium ions as I would say cofactors. So, you see the carbon dioxide being released. So, in this step you have the carbon carbon single bond being broken down and the carbon dioxide is released. In the succeeding step you find the carbon is been added with hydrogen and the source of hydrogen is NADH. So, this is that full string of pathway earlier we saw it is not only how the acyl CoA. So, once the acyl CoA the acetal decade is available and this is basically fixed up into I would say the coenzyme. So, that is how it works. So, you see here there are two pathways. So, TPP now the pyruvate actually is fixed or gets converted into acyl CoA. The equation what I showed you basically splits further and explains exactly how this happens. So, pyruvate has to pass through this phase of acetaldehyde then from there the acyl group is basically transferred to coenzyme. So, coenzyme is basically being acylated and pyruvate being the source and TPP would carry out this reaction. So, that is the breakup of the reaction what I have shown you. So, this is one more that is in the beginning of a citric acid cycle ok. So, you require this raw material to kick start the cycle and now in the once the cycle is up again you need TPP self to keep the cycle keep going. So, it is like a very important metabolic cycle where you need TPP to initiate and fuel the system and once the fuel is ready the cycle has to complete its course to produce ATP. So, we say in average 38 ATPs are produced by oxidative decarboxylation ok. So, this is extremely important for us and in one of the steps what we call it like alpha keto glutarate to succinyl CoA. So, wherever you have this coenzyme addition happening you always have this oxidative decarboxylation happening in parallel. So, this oxidative decarboxylation in this case NAD actually gets converted into NADH and TPP is involved and then you get again succinyl CoA. So, here also you see here lipoate coenzyme FAD in this case again you have lipoate coenzyme FAD in both you find a carbon dioxide being released. So, pyruvate it is actually added and you build a structure alpha keto glutarate and if you see glutarate has basically 5 carbon atoms whereas, succinyl CoA has only 4 carbon atoms. So, the glutaric acid and the succinic acid there is a conversion. So, glutaric acid being a 5 carbon molecule gets converted to succinic acid derivative that succinyl CoA 
and you lose one carbon atom in the form of carbon dioxide. So, that is what we mean by decarboxylation, you remove a carboxyl group and how do you do it? You do it in a oxidative manner. So, oxidative decarboxylation. So, these are two important steps involved. Now, we go further that is what I said how this thiol group is carrying out this reaction. So, it will be very interesting to uh, look further how this reaction happens. So, see over here you find the source of vitamin B1 what we take it from our diet ok. So, the normal thiamine gets converted to thiamine pyrophosphate. So, you see two phosphate groups are added over here and now this phosphate group once it is in the activated form ok. So, gets into the metabolic pathway and would carry out the reaction. So, you see over there the pyruvic acid comes over here and uh, the TPP is there and here you find the thiazolinium ring. So, the thiazol ring is basically gets converted into acetaldehyde. So, can you see over there there is a transfer reaction happening the acyl group is being added to the thiazol ring. So, now this particular fragment an active glyceraldehyde is formed. So, an hydroxyethyl thiamine pyrophosphate is formed. So, this is how the TPP gets converted or participates in the reaction. So, you see pyruvate would be the source of the I would say acyl group and this acyl group is added over here. So, that you get an intermediate hydroxyethyl thiamine pyrophosphate. Now, TPP in the course of the reaction would release this acetaldehyde which in turn enters I would say or gets combined with the coenzyme to give you acyl CoA. So, this is the key step I have just explained you the mechanism of how this happens. Now, as I have been telling you you have pentose phosphate pathway that is like ribulose 5P what we call it like pentose phosphate pathway again in this pathway you need TPP thiamine pyrophosphate. So, you see there the ribose phosphate which is like zoomed up over here the transketolase is the enzyme. So, in the citric acid cycle we have pyruvate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase involved whereas, in the pentose phosphate pathway the transketolase would be doing the reaction. So, you see over there the transketolase catalyzes the reaction of ribose 5 phosphate where you get converted into pseudoheptulose 7 phosphate and then you have fructose 6 phosphate and finally, the glucose 6 phosphate. Now, you see glucose 6 phosphate is the key compound in the glycolytic pathway and once glucose 6 phosphate enters glycolytic pathway eventually it gets converted into pyruvic acid and then the citric acid cycle happens. So, this is one way by which how a ribose 5 phosphate enters the citric acid cycle and uh, its ability to produce glucose 6 phosphate is the I would say summary or the marking feature of pentose phosphate pathway. So, you see over there so in every stage so it means like if you are looking at a metabolic role I would say the glucose metabolism as a whole. So, transketolase is one pathway where pentose phosphate pathway happens then alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase that is basically the citric acid cycle. So, pyruvate dehydrogenase is actually the end component of glycolytic pathway. So, you see here in the glucose metabolism as whole in all three levels or all three independent pathways which converge in the production of energy you are dependent on TPP. So, imagine if you do not have TPP you are not going to have a healthy cycle of these pathways happening in your body and since you might consume glucose, but for the glucose to produce energy it has to enter any of these pathway. The chains are being broken down and in every stage as the conversion happens ATP being produced and it is quite exhaustive the biochemical pathways that is happening and it is all interconnected. Now, the point here is if a person is deprived of thiamine from a dietary source then what will happen here is fundamentally there is uh, I would say an hinge in the glucose metabolism. The person might be taking food, 
but the person will not be in a position to produce energy. There is a metabolic deficit happening and eventually the person will become completely drained of energy. So that's one of the key features what you consider the person will feel uh, I would say very lethargic, uh, completely lazy, okay, not able to do any work. So you see the food what we take, if it contains only the macronutrients, okay, and you're not going to have, I would say, the key important components of this, obviously you're going to suffer from, I would say, the metabolic deficiency condition and eventually you end up in this disease called beriberi. We are going to look at that shortly. So you see over here, this is one aspect, how glucose metabolism is affected directly. In addition to that, you see there, vitamin B1 is involved in neurotransmitter production as part of pentose phosphate pathway. B1 is involved in the neurotransmitter modulation of acyl-CoA. See, because this acyl-CoA production, which happens with the help of pyruvate dehydrogenase, is not only a key ingredient in initiating the citric acid cycle and making it keep going, in addition to that, Acyl-CoA is also the acylating, I would say, component for the production of neurotransmitters. So what is neurotransmitter? Probably for people who are, uh, what do you say, finding it difficult to recollect, I would take uh, this time to explain you what is a neurotransmitter. So a neurotransmitter is fundamentally, uh, I would say, a key messenger. This key messenger basically is involved in the chemical communication between neurons. So you see there, there is a neuron over there and there is a neuron over here and communication between neurons happen in two ways. One would be, I would call it a very tiny electrical impulses are generated, what we call it like depolarization of a neuron. Okay, so one neuron and the other neuron communicate with each other through small electrical impulses. Okay, and there would be a series of changes happening in the membrane of these uh, axon and dendron and they would carry over the information, the coded information. But this junction is what you call it like the synaptic junction. So in a synaptic junction, the axonic end and the dendritic end, they will not exactly touch each other and you have a very tiny space, okay, in, in uh, I would say uh, in the range of nanometers where the axonic end would release certain chemical substances and they will sweep across the receptors for those neurotransmitters as mentioned here and they will go and bind to the receptors. Let us say there are many variety of neurotransmitters available. So that is a separate study in itself. Now talking about thiamine, since thiamine has a direct role in the production of acetylcholine, one of the neurotransmitter which gets affected primarily would be acetylcholine. Now recently people have found acetylcholine based neurotransmitter is extremely useful in many kinds of parasympathetic nervous system and also they are involved in the nicotinic receptors. Okay, so all nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors of the nervous system use acetylcholine. So think if acetylcholine production would be affected because of thiamine and eventually there won't be any nerve conduction. So there won't be any conveying of information across the nerves. So if nerve conduction is not there, consider all the muscles which have been innervated by nerves, they do not receive signal. That is one of the important symptoms connected with thiamine deficiency. So people suffer from, I would call it a condition called polyneuritis, nerve conduction is affected. So eventually the nerves will degenerate and there will be like kind of tingling sensation happens and mutually the neurons also degenerate and the corresponding muscles which have been innervated by the neurons also undergoes atrophication in the sense they start losing their potential and the person suffering from such condition would eventually end up in paralysis. Okay? So that is one of the reasons where and moreover see acetylcholine we know is connected with short term memory and memory and learning process. So they develop conditions like dementia. They are not able to remember, they are confused and uh, overall deterioration of mental faculty happens. So you see there, so this is how, this is a zoomed up version of a synaptic knob, what we call it. So these tiny 
uh, vesicles are filled with acetylcholine. So they go and bombard on the surface, releasing the neurotransmitters between the cleft and from there this goes and gets across the receptors where acetylcholine can go and bind and they carry over the signal. So this is what is the role of B1 in the production of acetylcholine. Now you look at this particular disease what we call it like beriberi. Okay. So beriberi is a very classic disease. In fact, if you are going to look at two major diseases that would kickstart research in vitamins. The very reason people had to really think of something else other than the macronutrients. Suppose you could provide people with sufficient protein, sufficient amount of let us say carbohydrates and lipids and all the major macro ingredients, would the person be healthy? Yeah, generally when we eat, we eat a complex variety of foods. So we do not go into an analysis of individual components, but we make sure the food contains primarily carbohydrate, the source for energy, but we are not really sure how this carbohydrate is effectively utilized. So that is how the story of vitamin research began. So beriberi history is always correlated with water soluble vitamin deficiency. So there are two places, one on the western end and one on the eastern end. The story of beriberi starts with this particular person so that you would be able to really appreciate his role and contribution. Okay. Although he was not awarded Nobel Prize, but he is considered as the pioneer in initiating studies on I would say beriberi. So he is Kenihiro Takaki. So he was actually uh, working in the uh, navy of Japan. So it, the story is quite interesting. So for quite some time people who were working in navy especially all the seamen who had to travel from Japan to Indonesia and other places. Okay, so they were posted over there. So they have to take up a long journey and depending upon the hierarchy of jobs. Okay, so the sailors were not provided with the wide variety of food substance what a navy captain would have access to. So for example, he was a physician in the navy and he noticed many of the crew members especially the lower cadder of sailors had been given only white rice, a polished rice. They did not have a variety of other supplements being added to their diet. All of them suffers, suffered from this particular condition called beriberi. Okay, so it was very interesting. Then he found uh, many of them who had come over there to the island had suffered from beriberi. So we made a close observation of what all diseases that they had and uh, previously the imperial army of Japan, they thought it is kind of an infectious disease. So according to his knowledge as a physician, he ruled out all the possibility of infectious diseases and then he made a close study and he found most of the people in the higher cadre, okay, like the captain and uh, of people who are in higher cadre and who are, who are having a variety of food uh, did not suffer from periberi. So this made uh, I would say uh, Takaki conduct the first I would say interesting clinical trial on periberi. So this idea was later taken up by the Christian Heckman and he actually won the Nobel Prize for it. He repeated these experiments in the birds. So we are going to look at some of the pictures of beriberi then you will know exactly kind of a very terrible disease that could be easily treated by actually offering a dietary supplement. The history of beriberi was the problem of the yeast, the sailors of the yeast. Whereas in the western the sailors they suffered from the disease of scurvy. So scurvy was also a disease connected with vitamin C deficiency. So the westerners were very much worried about scurvy, the eastern group were very much worried about beriberi because beriberi was a disease connected with I would say people who are consuming lot of rice. Whereas here people in the west obviously add wheat and other components so they did not suffer from beriberi but they did not have access to fresh fruits and citrus fruits especially. So for that reason they suffered from scurvy, so that is the end polar end. One group suffered from scurvy and the other group suffered from beriberi. So that is why 
whenever we look into the historic note of vitamin discovery so we have to like really understand the disease even in this modern era where we have access to a lot of food and if you are not like very particular in having a balanced food even in this generation people can suffer from beriberi so beriberi was so uh, i would say a, 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 a bad disease where eventually people would die okay so the takaki's uh, contribution in terms of finding out supplementing the sailors with i would say unpolished rice okay the brown rice uh, really helped them and he made a recommendation and his, his role was basically uh, recognized in the navy and navy quickly adapted strategies to at least provide them with uh, a cheap substituent what they call it like the brown barley so he recommended the sailors to take brown barley so he was even called uh, barley baron and eventually you find uh, the imperial army did not accept the suggestions of uh, this physician and they ended up losing lot of soldiers during second world war so it was such a important disease so you see over there this particular disease as a similarity to a disease what we call it like polyneuritis in birds suppose if you could feed birds fowl pigeons basically with i would say a diet deprived of thiamine so they quickly develop this particular symptom so what you call this symptom is basically hypostotonic posturing so there is a kind of a, a paralytic posture where the bird would like uh, wiggle its head in this fashion and it's a kind of a uh, inflammatory condition of the nerves so you see there these people who are so emaciated because of beriberi because the nerves have been affected and the muscles which supply the nerve also undergo degeneration so they become very lean in spite of taking i would say carbohydrate since the essential ingredient thiamine is not there their metabolic pathway the glucose metabolism gets completely screwed up okay we are going to see shortly so what exactly is this word beriberi so it might sound little different from you so it's actually a singleese word which says i cannot it means the person is so emaciated completely i would say lost energy is so weak and helpless and he's not able to even pull himself up and do any work eventually it spreads to other diseases like you say the vital organs the digestive system the heart the muscles and eventually the person would die so he he gets like completely paralyzed he is not able to move and he gets into a kind of a, a psychotic state and it's a very terrible disease but good thing about this that if you could supplement them with essential thiamine everything can be reversed so but that was not the case earlier so what uh, was done in the earlier stage was that dr funk was one of the persons who observed the writings of beriberi publications he conducted some of the experiments okay so with pigeons and uh, he could deprive the pigeons from pure source of thiamine which is basically unpolished rice and uh, then when he could feed them back with the rice polishing uh, polishings he was able to restore the condition so you see over there you have basically two types of beriberi i mean two different clinical presentations for beriberi so the one which we call it like wet beriberi so this is a kind of a disease where you find a typical edema present and uh, you look over there the cardiovascular conditions of beriberi where you see kind of a pitting edema so because of the cardiovascular complications you end up in wet beriberi you look over there you have basically increase in heart rate shortness of breath and since heart is not able to pump sufficient fluids you end up in the swelling of legs so i think i'll make a quick summary today we have seen how thiamine plays an important role in the metabolism of glucose and now it is extremely important in making one of the fundamental neurotransmitters acetylcholine 
and we started with beriberi explaining the symptoms of beriberi and the historic background of the disease of beriberi and how thiamine substitution and the role of thiamine was directly involved in this debilitating disease. So I would finish off with a question. So you could ask what is the metabolic role of thiamine? You have to enumerate all the key metabolic roles of thiamine. Then what are the major deficiency diseases of thiamine? So that would be beriberi. So thank you for your attention.